Check out these moments from the prison confessions of Gypsy Rose Blanchard. What we notice with mothers with Munchausen by proxy, and I say mothers because 95% are, is that they'll bring the child to the doctor, they'll say something's terribly wrong, you've got to figure out what it is, and the doctor does a bunch of tests and then says, we can't find anything wrong. Instead of being like a normal parent, oh, phew, I'm so glad to hear that. Thank you for reassuring me. These mothers will be upset. What do you mean nothing's wrong? Oh no, you've got to keep working. And they will find expert after expert for second opinion and fifth opinion. These people are not insane. They are exceedingly calculated. They plan, they hide the behavior, they go to great lengths to maintain that they're right. I remember there was a medication that I was allergic to and my mother would give me too much of that medication and then take pictures show them to the doctor and say, this is when she ate sugar. So I was having a legitimate reaction, but it was not to what she was saying it was. I didn't think I was allergic to sugar. I would have a candy bar here and there, and I would have no reaction to it. But at the time, I really didn't understand what was going on. When perpetrators of Munchausen syndrome by proxy finally get the diagnosis they've been searching for, they almost have a, uh, ah, uh, well, and you can almost see the gratification. My mother knew no knowledge of Nick whatsoever, and the relationship was filled with me having to sneak around with Nick, Gypsy's having kind of a, a dual life here. She's uh, maintaining a relationship with Nick, but also uh, still gratifying her mother. But there's going to be a uh, ultimate conflict as to what's more important to her. With my mother, I could lie and think nothing of it. But this was a really big secret the conflict of just being inherently strangled and controlled by this mother meant at some point this was going to blow up and boil over somehow. So when Gypsy loses her virginity, there's a rebelliousness at that point of saying, you know what, screw it. I'm going to have sex. I'm going to lose my virginity. And you're going to be feet away in a movie theater. There was absolutely a fear on Dee Dee's part that she was starting to lose control of Gypsy and also really fear that she would lose the sickness in her child, which was her lifeline. It was her reason to live. And so she had to teach Gypsy a lesson. Once she got me inside the house, she trained me to the bed. She smashed my computer and my cell phone, and I was chained for two weeks. What did she use to bind you to the bed? Handcuffs and a dog leash. The dog leash was connected to her. So anytime that I would move, she would feel me move. And if she was asleep, I would move, she would wake up. I was at her mercy for everything. So to go to the bathroom, for food. As punishment, she would not feed me every day. And she would eat whatever she wanted. So it, it was these things that she would do that was almost taunting. When I think of being chained up like an animal, that would be a mark of a mother who had no conscience, did not care about what her daughter uh, thought or felt. For two weeks, I tried to gain more of her trust. A lot of begging on my part. I promise I won't do it again, I'll be good. I will never talk to Dan again. 
to the point where she believed me enough to start allowing me little freedoms, like going to the bathroom on my own, taking a bath on my own. So leaving her sight for small amounts of time until she took me off the chain completely. After this attempt, she was very um, sensitive to when I would move in the bed. And she kept a knife by her bedside table. And she threatened me that if I was to attempt to run away, I would be punished for it. Dee Dee was very controlling, but yet dependent. And so there's going to be pretty harsh punishment and abuse if, you know, she defies her mother. After the two weeks that I was chained, my mother put a voodoo hex on me. She printed out a picture of Dan, and she printed out a picture of me, and she went to the store and got a mason jar and a cow tongue. She put the cow tongue in the mason jar with the two pictures and a little bit of my menstrual blood. Put it in a mason jar, buried it in the backyard, and said that you will never find love. You will never be happy. So I think that it's true. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I just think it's true because it's like every time I get close to someone, they leave me. Many men write to me in prison. That's how I met Ken. We got engaged in 2019, but it didn't work out. I was still such a young girl. I had so much to learn about relationships. And he left me. Then it broke my heart. And so it's like I always bring it back to that curse where I'm like, I believe it's true. She never wanted me to find love or be happy. I do have mixed emotions about not growing up with a father around. There's so many things that I wish that I could have experienced with him or experienced in general. <laughs> but I look at my sister and I look at all the things that my sister got to do that I never got to. And for a long time, I have been very jealous of my sister. And it's stupid, but the simple fact that she grew up with our father. She got to have him at prom. She got to have him teach her how to ride a bike. All the things that I never got to. And it hurts. I think about what could have been. I look at her, my sister, and I think maybe I would have just been just like her if I would have lived with my dad. You know, maybe I would have been cheerleading captain or something, you know. I want that opportunity for my father to guide me like a, a real parent should. But I do feel like my father doesn't want to tell me what to do because I have been told what to do my whole life. And I know that he wants me to make my own choices. I really don't know if Gypsy's been able to take part in any of the, the real cultural things that we have down, you know, down south here. She's, she has taken part in some uh, Mardi Gras type stuff, but as far as wildlife and, and out in the nature, I don't, I don't think she's had an opportunity to do a lot of that. Uh, roughing it a little bit, it's, it's, it's really fun. Depending what time of the year it is, uh, there's a season for everything here. From in the summertime, we do some fishing, crabbing, 
catching the big blue crabs and, and you know, bring them home and boil them right away. Have some friends and family over. Uh, have a good little crab ball. In winter time, we'll start doing some duck hunting, some deer hunting, um, which, which is real enjoyable. It's not so hot. Uh, we get to stay at the camp and make us a little fire at night. Frogs, we'll catch frogs. I know it's not a big thing around the rest of the country, but a lot of people down here, you know, they like frog legs. It's just, it's just fun. It's, uh, I mean, I brought Christy, uh, Mia, and at first they was like, Ugh, I don't want to touch a frog, but you get out there at night with your light on and you're kind of creepy and you're riding around and you see a frog and, you know, you pull up to it and, and grab it. And it's, uh, after you catch one or two, it's, it's, it's fun. They enjoy it. I'm curious to see how Gypsy's going to react to being out, out here in this environment. She's not out there alone. She's with me. I'll make her feel comfortable. Uh, but I'm curious to see how, how she's going to act in, in, that, uh, in that space there. So, just something totally different that she's never done before. She's probably going to say, man, I had a blast. Can't wait to go back. I hope. <laughs> you know. I think my first memory of Gypsy was me, my mom, and dad were laying in their bed. And I think it might have been a birthday or something that we had called her for. And we sung her happy birthday on the phone. God knows how old I was. But that's probably the first memory I have, just because I was so young. I was two when she'd come to the house or when we would actually be able to see her. I remember growing up and Gypsy being a lot older than I was, but she was into dolls and princesses. And I was never that kid. You know, I had maybe one baby doll. And I was more like a tomboy, you know, growing up with an older brother and being around all his friends. But I remember her talking about princesses and always wanting to go to Disney World, Star Wars, all that stuff. And I was like, maybe that's just how she is. I don't know. I didn't judge her for it. I just thought it was a little odd, a little strange. So around 14, that's when I started really craving that sister bond. Having somebody to, you know, do my makeup with or teach me how to do makeup. I would play in my mom's stuff. Um, but I was like, you know, it'd be cool to have a sister and all my friends had sisters, you know, that they got to share their clothes with, they got to do things with. And I missed out on that. I had a brother that liked to ride four wheelers. So that's what I grew up doing. I didn't grow up playing with makeup with my brother. I don't think it's fair that I got to miss out on that, but that kind of makes me sound selfish because it's also not fair to her. She missed out on just as much as I did. I may have missed out on, you know, having a sister, but I still got to go to prom. She missed out on having a sister, but she couldn't walk. You know, she missed out on so many things. We both missed out on a lot, just different levels of things that we should be doing at, you know, the ages that we were. I have prepared for my hearing for as many years as I've been in prison. Um, every choice that I have made, whether it be good or bad, leads up to this moment. I think if I had to spend my full 10 years within this facility, I'm not gonna lie, I would be heartbroken. Well, I wrote my letter to the uh, parole board to support Gypsy. I think Gypsy truly is sorry for everything that she went through and wishes she knew a better way to get out. You would have been proud of your baby girl. What about you? How'd you do? They asked you some questions? Yeah they, yeah, they asked me some questions. I told the parole board, I said, look, I don't condone what Gypsy did. Not at all. I understand why she did it. Gypsy sat in that chair, put her hands on the table, straight up, and talked from the heart. When they asked her, how do you feel, you know, about your sentencing, she said, 
It's not a 10 year sentence. I have to live with this for the rest of my life. Hey, Gypsy, how did it go? I was expecting it to be far more of tight and nerve wracking. I was expecting them to ask me to walk them through the crime itself. And they just asked me about life living with my mother. And I got to explain to them a little bit of what I went through with my mother. Do you feel optimistic that they're going to release you? Based on how well it went, I feel very optimistic. Gypsy is always going to struggle with certain things. But she is growing into a beautiful woman that could own up to her stuff when she needs to. I'm very proud of her. Gypsy was backed up into a corner, and she tried to get out, but she couldn't. I want to see her get out and live a life that she deserves. phone rings and I see it's Gypsy and she's like, Mom, guess what? I'm like, what? I got my answer today. It's really good news. I am leaving prison and going home on my earliest out date of December 28, 2023. I was jumping up and down and all excited. We just kept our fingers crossed. We were confident, uh, but still nervous. We were really happy. I'm just like so overwhelmed. I'm emotional. It just doesn't seem real. She was imprisoned for so long by her mom. And now that, that devil's not standing above her, watching every move that she made, She's completely free. I'm happy for her. I wish I could have done something for her so that she wouldn't have spent all this time in prison, but she can certainly go forward, and she will be a better person. Having the people that I love support me all these years, it means a lot to me.